welcome back to the all-in-one certification video series. I'm Mike Redmond, Master Trainer, here to guide you through your successful journey of becoming a Security Plus certified professional. We're going to walk through a variety of subjects like access control and encryption, all the way down to network security and hardening the OSs. In this section, we'll describe the different types of wireless network attacks, list the vulnerabilities of the IEEE 802.11 security, and explain the solutions for securing a wireless network. Wireless data communications have really revolutionized how we compute and computer networking in general. Wireless data networks are found virtually everywhere we go. This makes wireless networks the target for many attacks. Early wireless networking standards had a lot of vulnerabilities. Over the years, they have become more secure, and we'll discuss some of those standards later. Changes in the wireless network security field has yielded some security comparable to most all wired networks. So first, let's talk about some of the different wireless technologies, starting with Bluetooth. It uses short-range radio frequency transmissions to provide for rapid ad hoc device pairings, like your smartphone or headphones or tablet. There are two types of Bluetooth network topologies you must be familiar with, the PicoNet and the ScatterNet. The PicoNet is established when two Bluetooth devices come within range of each other. One device, we call that the master, controls all wireless traffic. The other device, which is the slave, takes the commands. The active slaves can send transmissions, and part slaves are connected but not actively participating. The ScatterNet is a group of PicoNets. They have connections between different PicoNets. Now, some of the attacks on ScatterNets and PicoNets start with bluejacking. It's an attack that sends unsolicited messages to Bluetooth-enabled devices, like text messages, images, or even sound files. They're considered more annoying, really, than harmful because no data is actually stolen or removed from the device. Next would be blue snarfing. It's unauthorized access to wireless information through a Bluetooth connection, often between cell phones and laptops. The attackers copy emails, contacts, and other data by connecting to the Bluetooth device without the owner's knowledge. Next, we'll take a look at some of the wireless standards, starting with who is the IEEE, the most influential organization for computer networking and wireless communications dating back to 1884. However, it began developing network architecture standards in the 1980s. In 1997, it released the IEEE 802.11 standard. This is the standard for wireless local area networks, or WLANs. Higher speeds have been added starting in 1999 with the introduction of the 802.11b standard. There are several wireless standards that you must be familiar with to successfully navigate the Security Plus examination, starting with 802.11a. It has specified maximum rate speed of 54 megabits, and it uses the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Next would be 802.11g. It preserves stable and it is widely accepted features of the 802.11b standard. It increased data rate transfers, however, similar to 802.11a. And then ratified in 2009 is the 802.11n standard. The improvement over A, B, and G, 802.11n brought more speed, better coverage, less interference, and better security. Next is your wireless client. Now, the Client Network Interface Card Adapter, or the Wireless NIC, performs some functions, same as the Wired Adapter. It's the antenna that sends and receives your wireless signal. That signal is received from the access point. The understanding that you need for the access points are it's an antenna, a radio transmitter and receiver to send and receive wireless signals. It's bridging software to interface wireless devices to other wireless devices. 
The access point acts as the base station, if you will, for wireless networks. It also acts as the bridge between wireless and wired networks. It can connect a wired network by a simple Ethernet cable. You also have autonomous access points. They're separate from other network devices and access points. They have necessary intelligence for wireless authentication, encryption, and management. Next are wireless broadband routers, a single hardware device containing the access point itself, the firewall, router, and DHCP server. This is what you're most familiar with, usually in your homes. Wireless networks have been vulnerable uh, to targeted network attacks because they're not restricted to a cable. It's hard to secure air. Types of wireless LAN attacks are discovering the network, attacks through the RF spectrum itself, and attacks involving access points. First, the basic vulnerability of the wireless LAN is being able to see it or discover it. It's one of the first steps in an attack is to be able to discover the presence of the network itself. All access points do what's called Beaconing. It's the wireless devices that scan for these beacon frames. It's done by an activity called war driving. It's a process of passive discovery of wireless networks and their locations. War driving leads to war chalking. It's documenting and then advertising the location of wireless lands for others to use. It was previously done by drawing on sidewalks or walls around metropolitan areas. Today, however, the locations are posted on websites. Next, the attacks through the RF spectrum, uh, using wireless protocol analyzers, uh, generating interference. Uh, a wireless protocol analyzer, the sniffer, it's a wireless traffic is captured to decode and analyze the packet contents later. It uses the standard NIC or network interface card days. However, it must be placed in the correct mode. The mode to capture all wireless signal, your NIC must be placed in promiscuous mode. The other modes for a wireless NIC are a master, that's when you can set your laptop or uh, other wireless device to act as an access point, uh, managed, that's generally what your client or the wireless device is set to by default, repeater, mesh, ad hoc, and monitor. Uh, monitor is synonymous with promiscuous mode. With interference, uh, the signals from other devices can disrupt the wireless transmissions. Some devices that cause interference with the wireless LAN are like microwave ovens and elevator motors, outdoor lighting and Bluetooth devices, as well as mirrors. Some of the attacks using access points are rogue access points and evil twins. A rogue access point is simply an unauthorized access point that allows an attacker to bypass network security configurations. It may be set up behind your corporate infrastructure behind the firewall, uh, opening the network to other types of attacks. Similarly, there is the evil twin. It's an access point set up by an attacker that attempts to mimic an authorized access point. The attacker captures transmissions from users to the evil twin access point, uh, hoping that they will authenticate to it with your trusted network credentials uh, and then simply log into your trusted wireless network using those captured credentials. The original 802.11 standard, the committee recognized the wireless transmissions could be vulnerable. It implemented several wireless security protections inside the standard itself. It left others to the wireless LAN vendor's discretions. However, those early protections were vulnerable and led to multiple types of attack. Next, we'll look at some of the ways to begin securing your wireless networks, starting with MAC address filtering. It's a method of controlling wireless LAN access by limiting the device's access to the access point itself. MAC address filtering 
is used by nearly all available commercial wireless access point vendors. It permits or blocks devices based on the MAC address, the physical hard-coded address on the NIC. Some of the vulnerabilities of MAC address filtering, however, are they address exchanges in unencrypted format, and the attacker can see addresses of approved devices and substitute it or spoof it on their own device. And managing a large number of addresses can be challenging, especially if you're trying to do it manually. Next would be the SSID broadcast. Each device must be authenticated prior to connecting to the wireless LAN. Uh, the open system authentication, uh, where devices discover wireless networks and send associated request frames to the access point, uh, that frame carries the SSID or the service set identifier. It's a user supplied network name and can be an alphanumeric string from two all the way up to 32 characters. Access points compare the SSID with the actual SSID of the network. If the two match, the wireless device is then authenticated. One of the earliest attempts of encryption was WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy. It encrypts plain text to ciphertext. It used a secret key and is shared between wireless client devices and the access point. Uh, the key is used to encrypt and decrypt those packets. Uh, however, the core vulnerability of WEP is it only used a 64-bit or 12-bit number to encrypt, and it used an initialization vector uh, that is only 24 of those original 64 bits, a very short length by modern computing standards which makes it extremely easy to break. WEP, in its early deploy, violated the cardinal rule of cryptography, which is avoid a detectable pattern. Attackers can see the duplication when the IVs start repeating. The keystream attack, or IV attack, attackers identify two packets derived from the same initialization vector. It uses the XOR function to discover the plain text. Once discovered the inherent weaknesses of the open system authentication and WEP, the IEEE kind of went back to the drawing board. It came back with a unified approach to wireless LAN security being needed. The IEEE and the Wi-Fi Alliance began developing some security solutions. The resulting standards that we use today are 802.11i and WPA and WPA2. WPA was introduced in 2003 by the Wi-Fi Annihilance. It's a subset of the 802.11i standard. The design goal was to protect present and future wireless devices. It, it uses what's called TKIP, or the Temporal Key Integrity Protocol Encryption. It's used, again, within WPA, and it uses a much longer key, 128 bits. This key is dynamically generated for each new packet, addressing the cardinal rule that was broken before, no repeatable pattern. It also introduced the idea of a pre-shared key authentication. After the access point was configured, the client device must have this same key value entered. The key is shared prior to communication taking place. It uses a passphrase to generate the encryption key and must be entered on each access point and wireless device in advance. It's not used for encryption. It simply serves as a starting point for the mathematically generating of the encryption keys themselves. However, the first attempt with WPA still had some vulnerabilities, mainly key management. The key sharing is done manually without security protection, so keys must be changed on a regular basis and keys must be disclosed to guest users. It uses passphrases. The pre-shared key passphrases of fewer than 20 characters are subject to cracking. Enter WPA2. It's the second generation of WPA. It was introduced in 2004 based on the final 802.11i standard. It replaces TKIP 
with the AES encryption, Advanced Encryption Standard. It supports both the pre-shared key and the 802.11x authentication. With AES CCMP encryption, it is the encryption protocol standard for WPA2. CCM is the algorithm providing the data security, and CBC MAC component of CCMP provides data integrity and authentication. It uses AES encryption and decryption. 802.1x authentication was originally developed for wired networks. It provides a greater degree of security by implementing port security. It blocks all traffic on a port-by-port -port basis until the client is fully authenticated. You can also choose to use EEP. The Extensible Authentication Protocol. It's a framework for transporting authentication protocols. It defines the message format and uses four types of packets, the request, the response, a success or failure. Lightweight EAP or LEAP is a proprietary method developed by Cisco Systems. It requires mutual authentication used for wireless LAN encryption using a Cisco client software. It can be vulnerable to specific types of attacks and is no longer recommended to be used by Cisco. PEEP, or Protected Extensible Authentication Protocols, simplifies the deployment of 802.1x by using Microsoft Windows logins and passwords. It creates an encrypted channel between the client and authentication server. You are expected to successfully navigate the Security Plus examination to know these different combinations of WEP, WPA, WPA2, their encryption standards, the type of authentication used, and the level of security that each provides. Some other areas to consider when it comes to wireless LANs and security are antenna placement. You want to locate it near the center of a coverage area and place high on a wall to reduce the signal obstructions and obviously to deter theft. Power level controls. Some access points allow adjustment of the power level at which the LAN transmit. Reducing power allows less signal to reach outside the intended area. With organizations becoming increasingly concerned about the existence of rogue access points, there are tools that can be used like rogue access point discovery tools. Security personnel can manually audit airwaves using a wireless protocol analyzer and continuously monitor the RF airspace using a wireless probe. Some of the wireless probes available are wireless device probes and desktop probes. The wireless device probes uh, can probe access points and dedicated probes. Uh, wireless virtual LANs or wireless VLANs also help organizations uh, set up a segregated infrastructure. For instance, one for employee access and another for guest access. It can be configured in one of two ways, depending on which device separates and directs the packets to the different networks. I know, it seems like a lot of information all at once, but remember, study hard. Lots of practice questions and you will succeed. You will become a Security Plus Certified Professional. I'll see you next time.